Warrior of the Mind from Epic the Musical was my top song of 2023, and it was not even close. By the time I found out about the project, half of the year was already done. But despite this, this song climbed all the way to the top of my YouTube music rap. Why? Because it is addicting. YouTube's music service is notorious for lowballing people, but I played this song 240 times, which is still a lot when you think about the musical theater girl math, which is that I would have had to listen to this song every single day for the rest of the year straight and multiple times a day to reach those numbers. The question for today is simple. What did they lace this song with? Why is it melodic crack for everyone from TikTok kids to professional musical theater performers and songwriters like myself? As we talk about the instrumentation, rhyme, meter, lyrics, and characterization, we'll discuss what makes this song so addicting. But even though I absolutely love this song, it is missing just one thing, and I want to reveal what that is too. Unlike the other things I cover though, Epic the Musical is still living and breathing and being worked on and values audience discussion and dialogue. So I feel pretty optimistic about giving this feedback because even if my particular suggestion is not implemented, I think that after the concept albums are done and they bring it to the stage or personally, I'm hoping for an animated musical, it'll all iron itself out. So I want to use this missing thing to show you guys how an itty bitty change can make an amazing song into a masterpiece. Good day everybody, it is Kalaxin here to nerd out on Kalaxin Cares Too Much about something that I know we all care about. Finally, I had an amazing time reacting to the Thunder Saga in the live stream with you guys and doing that analysis and discussion. And so I know that I don't need to make you care. We all already care about this. And so I can't wait to show you guys what secrets I've discovered about this song. Starting with the instrumental for this section, it has a very compelling story, even on its own. Without the lyrics, you can still feel the journey that the music is taking you on. And unlike my other deep dives where we have no access to the composer or lyricist because they worked on an animated Barbie movie musical that released 20 years ago, because Jorge is so down to earth and talkative with the audience, we actually do have information about the secret sauce here. This is so refreshing because musical theater songwriting is shrouded in this mystery. Like the only way you can find out about the process of the greats is by paying thousands of dollars in university or traveling for an in-person conference. There aren't a lot of resources online even still. And so Jorge is just giving it all for free, talking about his process for free in a very accessible place like TikTok. And I just love that. So thanks to Word of God, we actually have some information about character lip motifs and instrument associations. This specifically is absolutely genius, and musical theater masters like Sondheim strongly believed in doing this. Songs must be both surprising yet familiar or inevitable, and lit motifs serve this well because they are simple refrains that become familiar to the audience. You will always know that this specific piano melody is associated with Athena. That is something that you will learn as you go through the show, and it grounds you in familiarity. But where the surprise comes in is how Jorge uses the simplicity to ground the audience, but then changes the themes as the story progress and elevates it with the other instruments involved. You hear the same theme, but they become fragmented or interwoven with each other or turned upside down and they change as the characters change. It's so satisfying how you can hear Athena's theme now, but then track it through the entire show and see how it changes. So this song starts out with Athena's quick thought, and this is represented by the ticking clock and the rewind effect. This is telepathy with Odysseus, where they can have an entire conversation with each other in an instant. Have you forgotten the lessons I taught you? Athena! This sound is very foreboding with a steady tick, but the reason why the song is like crack for our ears is because it's contrasted with the piano being very fast paced. This contrast makes the song feel energetic and exciting, but it also feels dangerous, which is why it's so entrancing and hypnotizing. The chanting of the chorus is much more obvious, and I believe they are chanting the danger is nearby lip motif. This is another excellent example of what I mean. Like you have these familiar themes, but the danger is nearby. Lit motif never gets stale, never gets old. It scares you every time you hear it because you hear it in so many different ways throughout the sagas. Athena's lit motif intertwines with it and the other instruments make it feel new. The easiest way to be able to hear this lit motif, by the way, is by imagining the captain, captain, captain over places where you think that the lit motif may appear. So when Athena comes in, I believe we get captain and it's descending very slowly. Have you forgotten to turn off your heart? This is not you. I see you changing from how I've designed you. Have you forgotten your purpose? Let me 
remind you. Obviously, because My Goodbye is also an Athena song, we do hear the same little piano thing that we hear at the beginning of Warrior of the Mind in that song as well. And I love that for the narrative significance. In this song, Athena is angry because Odysseus is rejecting the lesson she taught him and her fury is in that fast-pacedness of the piano. But when we get to My Goodbye, the quick piano is still here because what has changed? Nothing has changed since the initial confrontation. Odysseus does not get better. In fact, he only gets more rebellious. He only gets worse. Fast forward all the way to the Thunder Saga, we do feel Athena's presence a couple times, but now it's different because Odysseus actually understands what she was trying to tell him, and so the theme has progressed to be slower, more melancholy, more sad. For example, in Suffering, when the siren says to go to Scylla, all the other instruments drop except for the piano when she sings, This is the only way home. Odysseus realizes that he will have to sacrifice these six men to Scylla, and Athena's warnings were trying to prepare him for times like this where there was no other way. It's the same in Thunderbringer too. When Odysseus is all alone, you hear the piano come in and you hear that one day you'll hear what I'm saying. It's like those notes and they're arranged a little bit differently. And I think that people said that it's mixed with the lullaby for Odysseus's son. Like it's mixed with the sun's lit motif as well, which makes sense because apparently Athena is training the sun. So you have that mixture, that transition of one day you will understand. Odysseus finally understands. And now it's like, well, we're moving on from Odysseus. Like. <laughs> Not screw him, but like kind of like Odysseus finally learned his lesson, but we're transitioning to the new pupil that Athena is teaching, which is his son. But yeah, just hearing that in the Thunder Saga feels like an answer to, is this what it means to be a warrior of the mind? Because you have Odysseus being like, I finally know what it means. I finally understand what you were trying to tell me this entire time. And Athena's just like, yup, that's what it is. And you can almost hear it ends on that just a man. And then the Thunder Saga ends. This is Athena's motif. If you make some small adjustments to it so that it can be played on a triplet style beat, like one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, then it sounds like this. And this is actually what we hear in song eight, remember them. No, what good would killing do? The reason why the triplets are significant is because later we find out the music of Poseidon is always in triplets. And this is a moment where Athena is being more on the ruthless side. If we wanted to have some fun with it, we could completely change the vibe of it by changing how I play the left hand. Check this out. Scylla has a cost. Well, you ask to know you know. Now jump in the water! So moving on to the meter here, again, we have a nice mix of surprising yet inevitable. We have these two lines of 11 right here, which anchor us and they're very nice and neat. But when this 10 happens, you may think, oh, we're going to do the same thing that we did before. But instead, we get these nice, short, threatening lines of this is not you. Let me remind you. These lines of 11 have an upwards momentum, which is natural when we ask a question. Our inflection goes up, whereas these short phrases are a statement like this is not you, right? It has a downwards momentum. Momentum, and that's again very natural to the way that we talk and it reinforces that Odysseus you're in trouble, bro 
something that we were always told in school is that it's more interesting to genuinely ask a question than to just be sarcastic, right? And I feel like what's great about this is that it's actually more menacing that Athena's actually asking. She's not being sarcastic. She's legitimately like, are you fucking stupid, right? And so I feel like that that's actually more scary than her just being like, that's a rhetorical question. Of course you forgot, right? It's like, have you seriously forgotten the lessons I've taught you? That's what makes us scared. In terms of alliteration or fun sounds, something that I appreciate with all of the epic lyrics is that the alliteration is more complex than just two words starting with the same sound. Like for example, you have to turn and that's front sound alliteration. But what's more interesting to me is how the lyrics create flow with something like forgotten the lesson. Cause you have the in in forgotten and lesson, but you also have the crispy T in forgotten and the. Even more crispy though is forgotten to turn. And then over here, this is, is very similar in that way because you have that hiss back to back. These sounds emphasize the firmness of Athena's anger. And remember, the voice is ultimately an instrument, just like everything else that produces sound, right? And so in school, I remember learning about this song and I can't remember what it is, but it was all made up nonsense words. And it was so fascinating how the vowel or the consonant choice still invokes something and layers onto the instrumentals and can tell you a lot about emotion. So I love when the alliteration in the epic is like this. We also have me and re in remind, which is very smooth and again, emphasizes Athena's superiority over Odysseus. In terms of how to implement this into your own songwriting, like I don't think that Jorge sat down and was like, oh, I wrote shut off my heart. I need to change it to turn off my heart for those crispy teas. Like in theory, you could go back to the lyrics that you've written and try to find places where you can improve word choice or improve alliteration. But I think that this is something that just we naturally start to pick up because we have things that sound nice to our ears. And then we also have a natural way of speaking as well. Instead of looking at songs, I would actually suggest looking at speeches either in a TV show, let's say like a monologue or a speech from a historical person, like maybe a president. I don't know. Just because those speeches tend to have alliteration because alliteration is a very common speech writing tool in order to punctuate a point. So back to the song, similar to how the instrumental feels very hypnotizing and twisty, if you want to call it that, there's also twistiness in forgotten to turn or forgotten the lesson. And it really pulls you in and it just spirals nicely in our minds. I find that with the entire epic, it does this so well. And it just, I don't know, it scratches something in my brain. It just twisted, it swirls around in my head. When it comes to rhymes, we have some nice usage of a word before the last word in the phrase rhyme with taught you not to, which is perfect, and also designed and remind, which are also perfect. Rhymes like this make it easy for the audience to come along on the journey because they create clarity and also anchor the audience. The audience can start predicting things and that gives them a little dopamine hit. In terms of lyrical meaning, what I find really interesting about this is that this song makes a good use of repetition in this introduction. We have this same sentence twice, but then we have a deviation. Instead of things getting boring and stale by doing the third have you forgotten right away, we change things up with I see you changing from how I've designed you. Again, this is surprising yet inevitable. These things tend to come in threes, and so we are predicting the third thing, like three familiar things and then the deviation. But technically, we do have three. In order to make things familiar, we still keep that three, but to make things fresh, we don't do what's so predictable and have them all be in a row. Because imagine they did, have you forgotten, have you forgotten, have you forgotten the way I've designed you? You are astray from your purpose, let me remind you as the final line. Tell me your thoughts on this, but I don't think it sounds as good. This format is more effective because it emphasizes Athena's desire for Odysseus to stay the same, for him to obey her. A build of three and a deviation is usually for when a character breaks free from the status quo in a good way, but Athena is not happy about this. How Athena lectures Odysseus stays the same, have you forgotten, except for the one line where she's pointing out how he changed and how she doesn't like it. When she points out how Odysseus is changing, her line changes, which reinforces that this is a bad thing because she immediately goes back to have you forgotten after that. Have you forgotten is about the lessons that she wants him to remember. And so she wouldn't end off on I see you changing because she doesn't want him to go that way. She wants him to return. She wants him to go back to the way that he was. So she points this out and then she goes back to her same line in how she was lecturing him. If the line about Odysseus changing was last, you wouldn't get any of that. 
I think this is so clever and so compelling, and it's just crazy how much we're already finding 30 seconds into the song. As we continue to talk about the lyrical meaning here, I want to introduce a theory I have about rhyme structure in the epic. And I'm like 80% sure that I'm right about this, but instead of locking myself in the dungeon and not posting until I'm 100% sure, I thought that we could figure it out together since epic fans love to discuss and puzzle solve and find all the little secrets. So musical theater discourse time, 99% of old school musical theater lyricists don't believe in using imperfect rhymes at all. Musical theater prioritizes specific specificity and clarity above all else, because unlike other things, musicals are narrative and stories are about planting and payoff. We are taught that true rhymes work best on every level when it comes to payoff because imperfect rhymes lack lyrical and sonic clarity. One misunderstood word could change the entire meaning of a lyric, could change how the audience sees a character. And because of that, if the audience gets lost or confused in that way, the later payoff cannot be satisfying. Geniuses like Sondheim believed that perfect rhymes were more satisfying, more clever, made jokes funnier, were able to punctuate the thoughts and snap in a word stronger. A perfect rhyme is like a sharp sword that is able to slice through things, like having sharp wit will slice through you, but a near rhyme won't do that and will blunt the impact of your payoff. There's a lot of hostility towards imperfect rhymes in general, like it's a crutch, the standards of wordplay and wit used to be higher, this is just laziness, this new generation of lyricists are lazy, I've heard so many things like that. But after reading through a lot of things, I don't think the beef here is with imperfect rhymes. I think that for a lot of professionals and audience members who hate them, it's more about how lyricists today are not being discerning enough when using them. In one of Sondheim's books, he has this juggling metaphor, and I feel like it actually validates what I'm going to say. To me, he's saying that imperfect rhymes are not impactful when you want to have satisfying payoff. He sees lyricists using near rhymes or non-rhymes in places where it's inappropriate because it lessens the audience's satisfaction when it comes to the payoff. And some of you guys may see where I'm going with this, but what if you don't want the payoff? I think that sometimes you do want that suspense. You do want to leave something unresolved. You do want to create that dissonance. And that, I think, is when it's appropriate to use an imperfect rhyme. Cleverness or wit or skill does not come from only using true rhymes. Cleverness comes from knowing what the best choice is and that choice having a narrative purpose. The problem with imperfect rhymes as they are used in most modern musicals is usage without purpose, and that doesn't serve the objective of the lyric or the song. With all that in mind, in Epic, we have a mixture of imperfect and perfect rhymes. But this is not out of laziness. It strikes me as very intentional and calculated. Because Jorge is so methodical with layering multiple meanings into the music for a narrative purpose, it led me to believe that the rhyme structure also served the story in a similar way. And if he didn't do it intentionally, we were always told in school to just take credit for our accidental genius and pretend like it was our plan all along. But I do really feel like that the rhymes reflect the themes of the epic. So what is the epic rhyme theory? At first I thought that perfect and imperfect rhymes could have had something to do with literal perfection. Like if you have a lot of perfect rhymes, you are closer to the image of the gods. However, this started to fall apart when characters used perfect rhymes and they were stupid. The characters that broke my heart and ruined my dreams were Polites and Eurylochus rhyming sheep, keep, treat, and fleet together because those are perfect rhymes, but it can't be a sign of perfection or godhood because they are wrong! They are dumb! <laughs> but you'll notice that Odysseus has an imperfect rhyme and then a perfect rhyme. True food does not perfectly rhyme, but true rhymes with the Cyclopses, who are you? And then when I heard it's almost too perfect, too good to be true again, it suddenly hit me. Aristotle theorized or philosophized, I guess, that moral virtue is found in the middle road of two extremes. For example, when it comes to having courage, too much courage is being reckless and stupid. You're an idiot. But having too little courage or no courage at all makes you a fearful coward. It is virtuous to have a reasonable amount of courage in the face of fear. So the internal logic of this theory is that the rhyme structure or repetition of certain things is supposed to showcase when the characters are flowing between these states of moral deficiency, moral virtue, and moral excess. 
I haven't found anything to dispute this idea yet. There are multiple times where I'd peg Odysseus as being arrogant and reckless and stupid, and he's rhyming multiple times in a row. He's doing too much. But there are other times where Odysseus has this very specific structure of imperfect rhyme, perfect rhyme, and it happens a lot. For example, closely, slowly, slay, pay from the horse and the infant, we have this imperfect rhyme followed by perfection. Closely and slowly do not rhyme, it's more of a slant situation, and then slay and pay are the perfect ones. This is not sloppiness. This is not a lyricist being like, we just did it because we ran out of ideas. It's so intentional. It happens all the time. And what was really damning was looking at just a man. Odysseus starts as having that same order of imperfect and perfect rhymes with known home, which is imperfect, and then life, wife, which is perfect. It's the same format from the horse and the infant. But then when he sings about being a monster, nothing rhymes, nothing here even imperfectly rhymes. The most you have is blaze and blame sharing a bit of a front half, but that's not even a slant rhyme. That's more, again, alliteration. Forgive me also has no rhyme, which again points to this being intentional to me because who can't find a rhyme for me? There are so many rhymes. Me has so many easy rhymes. It could have been forgive me for you see I'm just a man, but Odysseus just repeats the forgive me over and over again. He repeats this refrain of forgiveness because there's nothing else he can say. He can't say for you see because who could see the validity in doing this, right? He kills an innocent baby. He's operating at a moral deficiency here in terms of virtue. And this is the start of Odysseus going down a bad path, going down the path that we see him follow all the way to the Thunder Saga. So when you look at the rest of the show, when they're doing way too much, they are operating in excess. But when they're doing too little, when they don't rhyme at all, they are in deficiency. And could this be a coincidence? Like, sure, maybe it's not moral virtue, but it's suspense versus closure, and this just happens to all overlap with each other, right? But I don't exactly buy that because there are other moments in the musical where you would think that they're holding tension and suspense, but they do perfectly rhyme. I truly think it's a choice about creating balance versus imbalance in a musical where the theme is that middle ground between cruelty and naivete. So now that I got you up to speed, Athena has a very interesting structure here. Is this balance? Compared to her first verse, which has a lot of internal and ending rhymes, it does give a bit more of an impression of balance. We don't have excessive perfect rhymes yet, and when we do have perfect rhymes, they don't even punctuate the end of each lyric because you is the last note. Athena has the impression of balance, like she hasn't smited Odysseus where he stands because of his disrespect. She is showing him a little bit of patience and restraint. And I know that when I listened to this song the first time, I was entirely Team Athena because of the emphasis on you, as in Odysseus, as in you fucked up, Odysseus. But underneath that fairness, or that illusion of fairness, I think, is a little bit of arrogance. And this is foreshadowed here through the repetition of Have You Forgotten and the endings of you. Those endings of you tell a completely different story. Let me explain. This opening is what I taught you, how I've designed you. Let me remind you. She believes that she knows Odysseus better than Odysseus does, even saying that this behavior isn't like him. But isn't it odd that instead of explaining why it isn't like him, she is entirely focused on why she is insulted? She doesn't even communicate anything personal to him. Like most characters in these circumstances, whether a hero or a villain would have been like, this isn't like you. What happened to the man that would do anything to see his wife and son again and use that as persuasion? Zeus even does this. He has enough sense to be like, hey, you can say goodbye to Penelope and Telemachus, right? He uses that against Odysseus when convincing him to kill the baby. You appeal to what another character believes in to get them to do what you want. If you took a shot every time Odysseus talked about getting home to see his son and wife, you would probably die. But Athena doesn't even mention this because he doesn't give a fuck. And I think it's because from her perspective, Odysseus should believe in her. She shouldn't need to use any other mode of persuasion. This being all about her should be all the persuasion that he needs. And this is not Athena slander, by the way. I love this for her character because it shows the desensitization and divide between the man and the goddess. I'll mention this again later, but Athena is the goddess of wisdom. She is not the goddess of people skills. And that's how most of the Greek gods are. They do not understand how to appeal to humanity without using fear. 
And this becomes really interesting with My Goodbye because you think that Athena would have said this in this song. Like, if you don't listen to me, your friends are going to die. But she never mentions them here. She never mentions anybody here. She only mentions Odysseus's friends after Odysseus already made the mistake that got Polites killed. And she only uses that as evidence that Odysseus should have listened to her. The only time where she ever gets personal with him is just to rub salt in the wound after the fact. And it's like a Athena thinks that Odysseus should be more afraid of her, disappointing her, compared to anything else in the world, and she only uses the deaths of his friends to reinforce that, which is insane. Like, I love it, but like, girl, you're insane. <laughs> Yeah, we're not done with this slide yet, by the way. Continuing on, I also heard recently that you should put your most important lyric in powerful positions, such as the beginning or the end, in order to have an extra punch and for it to be more memorable. Because our memory works with usually remembering the first things in a list and maybe the last things, right? So starting with, have you forgotten the lessons I taught you, is immediately introducing us to the conflict of the song, which is very good. It establishes the relationship Athena has to Odysseus, this mentor that they have, and that's packing a lot of good information in, in just a single line. Athena is his mentor. She taught him, and not only this, she is insulted that he seems to have forgotten or is actively disobeying the lessons that she taught him. And Odysseus does not dispute this. He's not like, no, Athena, you don't understand. He just says her name, you know? It's not like this song is, I'm sorry, mom, I won't do it again. Like, she is just drilling into this man, and Odysseus can't deny it to her. Think of a song section like a necklace, right? Okay, the first line is this powerful chain that literally holds your eye idea together. It's the only thing keeping everything on the necklace and not having it fall off. And the middle lines are like little beads that you string on. They're not life-changing. They're not a giant thing in the middle of your necklace, right? But like they flatter. They make the chain look nice. It's more than just a chain now. So the little beads on the necklace are lines like what Athena taught him, right? To turn off his heart. This is not you. What did Odysseus do then? Presumably something that showed mercy or weakness or some other sensitivity. But this ending line is like putting the big thing in the middle of the necklace. This is reminding Odysseus of his purpose, because Athena's purpose hangs in the balance too if he fails. We introduce the conflict, but this is like the thesis, right? Odysseus needs to be reminded of his purpose, because Athena's purpose also hangs in the balance if he fails. If he fails, it is a personal failure for her. So we start with something as simple as, remember that thing I taught you, all the way to, if you do not follow the lessons I taught you, you have failed your purpose, and more importantly, you are betraying me. And things really go downhill for Odysseus when he rejects Athena's advice, as we see, because because when she said she was leaving, homegirl meant it like she has not come back. So this is everything just packed into the intro, and obviously we're starting off very strong here. And this opening makes you want to find out more, because we don't have everything spoon-fed to us. We can make certain inferences, but there's still that sense of mystery. Like, okay, but what exactly is she reminding him of? Like, we have an idea, but what are the specifics of this situation? What is Odysseus gonna do? How's he gonna react? Will he listen to her, or will he disobey? Will he rebel? Also, the song is called Warrior of the Mind, and often the title is also the thesis, right? And so we need to find out what a warrior of the mind is. Again, we have some ideas, but we need a bit more context, right? The journey is us finding out what Athena defines the warrior of the mind as, what she believes that Odysseus's purpose is, and then we have to decide whether or not we agree with her or disagree with her. And we also haven't run into that one problem that I said I would reveal at the beginning of the video. So let's move on to the next section and see how it holds up. Moving into the instrumental of the verse, we have a nice musical reaction after Goddess of Wisdom with the little piano trickle, again reinforcing to us that this is Athena's lit motif. Goddess of Wisdom, Master of War. trickle happens throughout this part, and it creates contrast while the chords are used to punctuate certain parts of her melody line. And again, this is contrasting with the ticking, which is still very steady. 
This section also gives us something intimate and personal because instead of just still yelling at Odysseus, right, we have established who Athena is and what she wants. This section feels a bit more private, like instead of again ripping into Odysseus, she's talking to the audience now. As we move on to where challenge comes in, we still have the piano part, but now we've introduced this like ocarina of time-like instrument joining in with her melody, and it feels very godlike, but it also brings us down to the setting. Athena needs a human to do this, a human hero, and so we bring in that more human folk-like element, but it still sounds a little godly, like it's a nice compromise in between those two things, and it has like, we're going on an adventure! Again, Legend of Zelda! I had a Anybody feel like that if you really close your eyes? This kind of sounds like the Wii Sports Resort songs. Anyway, I feel like I also hear chanting here, but I don't think it's the danger limb motif anymore. I think it's just like backup for what Athena is saying. In terms of the structure here, we only hear this verse once, and because we have nothing to compare it to, it can be pretty much whatever it wants. You'll see in my other videos, if we have multiple verses, they are usually, if the songwriter is good, they are usually the same. If content dictates form, if you have multiple verses, they're supposed to be the same, because they have the same purpose. They deliver information, so they should be the same. But this doesn't happen again, and I think it's because Athena tells us everything that we need to know, so we don't need to repeat this. I also really like how this builds here because with this top part we have a nice momentum and it creates some suspense some mystery you're not quite sure where we're going yet but this part really builds upwards and we start to get like in the flow or like in the swing of things and on paper this is 9 10 and then 8 10 but there's like a pause after came and so i think that that irons everything out and so i don't really mind that there's a syllable inconsistency if this was nine syllables and then this line was like 15 syllables crammed into the same amount of time, it would be a different story, but something like this is fine. For this verse, we have what I am calling Athena being crispy and twisty. In these first two lines, we don't have an ending rhyme, but rather we have create and then the great in greatest, and we have more twists at the beginning of words. Like goddess, whiz, miss, it's that S, and I do like wisdom, war, warrior, master, mission as well for that front alliteration. And then coming down here, I really like bore, best, boy, and the repetition of that, as well as the the thrill for the th and the my and rai of mind and rivaled. So when it comes to rhyme, if we're talking about my rhyme theory, what's interesting is that we do have a bit of balance in this top part. We have no completely perfect rhymes. We have create and great as the anchor point and then the frontal alliteration, as I said, to give us flow. But this is like a truthful statement from Athena, right? Like it's not laced with any arrogance and it's just facts. You know, there's not really any moral relevance to what she's saying here. She's just speaking about herself. But you'll notice that when we get down here, we go from zero to a hundred, and Athena has this overabundance of rhymes, which I see again as evidence of her self-indulgence or boasting, which is another moral excess. It's just funny to me because she's bragging about her genius plan when I'm like, bestie, you're the god of wisdom. Like, I believe you. We believe you. And if Odysseus was singing about the challenge and praising her, it'd be a little bit different. But this is just Athena praising herself, which is hilarious. Like, she's relishing in her own genius. We have the internal rhymes of test, best, for, Bore, which are all perfect, and then obviously skill, kill, thrill, will. And I also like how mind really stands out against all these things because we have a lot of harsh words, I guess, like test, best, for, right? And then we have mind, and mind just sort of floats. It makes the idea of the warrior of the mind immediately strike us as important. And again, in terms of lyrical meaning, this is not Athena slander, okay? This is what makes Athena so compelling. She is the goddess of wisdom. On a meta level, the audience loves Athena. She's smart, she's strong, she's beautiful. Her voice makes us weak and strikes fear into our hearts like she has it all. But despite how powerful she is, Athena in the epic really strikes me as like a little insecure. She's already the goddess of wisdom, like no one's gonna take that away from you, bestie! But she still feels this need to prove it. 
It's like she must validate her own existence and create a reason for people to worship her and celebrate her even more, which is why this is her mission in the first place. Also, I tried to avoid doing too much mythology research for this video because the show needs to be able to stand on its own and speak to the person that has never heard of Greek mythology before, right? Like, I want to focus more on what the musical tells us or the common knowledge that we have as opposed to needing to do homework or extra research because we shouldn't need to do that to understand the story. But I got a little curious and I read that Athena took the side of the Greeks in the Trojan War while Ares took the opposite side. I feel like that when this has a script, whether it's again a movie or on stage, they should try to dig into this a little more because I feel like that that's the beef here, right? There's only one goddess of wisdom, but master of war, like a bunch of gods could be that. So that's up for grabs. I can infer that maybe other gods like Ares have great warriors and Athena is like, well, I want one that's smart instead of a brute, instead of brawny or whatever. And that is what makes Athena so compelling because she's both the underdog, but also she has this level of vanity and arrogance about her. Like she's the underdog in her own story. She's the protagonist in her own story. But when you think about her and Odysseus, she's kind of the antagonist sometimes. I feel like that she wants to win this Ares related beef, right? She wants to challenge how things are done, but she also has no concern for the damage it does to Odysseus in the long run, and we see that later. And I think, like I said, the first time around, I think people will really root for Athena, but it's only in hindsight that you see her mentality is really self-serving. Like, Athena is right, but that's her flaw. Athena is wise, and we see that with what happened with Poseidon. She was right, like, what she said for Odysseus not to fucking do came back to bite him in the ass, right? But her own vanity undermines her point and the willingness of people to listen to her. It's like how people say no one wants to hear criticism from someone being an asshole. Like, the criticism may be right, but part of wisdom is knowing your audience and molding your words to appeal to them. And Odysseus knows how to do this, but Athena refuses to have that human element. She's the goddess of wisdom, not the goddess of people skills. Anyway, this section is really good at telling us all the information that we need to know as the audience and establishing Athena's I want. Because this is kind of an I want song. Like, we have the exposition in the verse, but we also get what she wants, that musical theater classic. And it's also just fun to sing. When we talk about surprising yet inevitable, this has a nice flow where, again, the audience can feel confident despite not knowing anything about Greek mythology because we're locking in skill, kill, thrill, will. We can start to predict what is going to happen. And so we're able to snap in. We are lulled into that sense of security. And it continues to hook us on this journey because we have, OK, there's a challenge. What was the challenge? Oh, the challenge was the boar. Did Odysseus kill the boar? How did Odysseus kill the boar? It's like every single line is answering a question, but it's also bringing up another question. With the consistent rhyme structure, it resolves and has a satisfying conclusion. But in terms of the narrative, we never quite finish, right? We ask one question to create another. And going into the course, we're wondering, well, okay, Odysseus killed the boar, but like, what does that mean? You know, like that was just the beginning of their story together. There's so much more to it. And so it never gets stale because we're climbing, we're building. It never stays still. We're still developing the story as it happens. We have all this exposition, but now we're transitioning into the emotional part of the song. The course is the answer to the thematic question of what Athena thinks a warrior of the mind will be like. And this, of course, brings us into the course. Okay. Anyway, so for the instrumental here, I like the trumpets coming in when Odysseus is like, let's go. And this type of musical reaction is very important for musical theater. And it makes this part feel very heroic. You also have the association with royalty that the trumpets have, which makes sense because Odysseus is a king.
This new sound mixes nicely with the Athena piano that we've already heard. And this course feels powerful. It feels direct. There's a sense of triumph for Athena because one step of her plan is already complete. Like she had to find the person. So we got that. Yay, right? Like after a lot of mystery and tension and suspense, we have victory here in the course, which makes us cheer as the audience. We feel a little bit of release. Like, yeah, we did it. Not only does the instrumental help to make this part catchy, but the course is very catchy because of the structure as well. Like you have this bounce almost, and you can just imagine again, we balance more like shifting your weight or something. Like there's a little bop to it, right? And so I like that unevenness compared with our anchor points here. Like we have these bits of 10-10, right? And like most of it, we also have the 8-8 for the warrior of the mind line, and that anchors us. But like we have a little bounce, like then they'll see, you know? And that little break, it makes Athena feel more human. Like as Athena gets less emotional and more plotting, we have evenness. And then we have the warrior of the mind for the evenness. But then we have these more genuine feelings like then they'll see, right? And these moments humanizes her. And the structure complements this release of Athena's tension after all this time. For alliteration and little fun sounds, I like May of Maybe and then also Day. I also like Make and Great again. It's kind of similar to Create and Greatest from last time. And I also like World and Warrior for the front alliteration. This is sort of a freebie, I guess, but Hill, Will, Vale, I'll, like technically that has repetitiveness as well. Like that's not intentional. That's just like how contractions work, but you know, fine. We'll give it to that too. And I also like build and skill just for that ill. In terms of our rhyme theory, this section has balance. Like we have the me and see, and then we have reach and teach, but it's not that overabundance that we saw in the verse. And from my perspective, this is because Athena is being truthful rather than boastful. Like if you disagreed with this theory on the basis of, well, you know, at the hype parts, they rhyme more and at the suspense parts, they don't rhyme, right? Like why isn't there rhyming here then? This is the hypest part of the song, but there's only minimal rhyming compared to what happened in the verse. This is where all the hype stuff is happening. This is the part that gets you bopping, but yet we have balance. And this brings us into the lyrical meaning here because Athena genuinely wants to make the world a better place. And this is something that endears us to her. This is really important because we start the song with her scalding Odysseus, right? And then we have a section that could come off as her being cold and calculated or patting herself on the back, depending on how you want to look at it. So either way, this entire thing has been about Athena. So you may not get like a great first impression or you may get a scary one at the very least. Like you may think there's still a little bit of ego and then they'll see, right? But wanting to be validated based on truth is not a moral excess, if that makes sense right? Like being validated for something that you actually legitimately did. Like that's not a problem. Like that's not selfish, right? And so for this, it, it's not just senseless bloodlust. It's because a warrior like Odysseus could change how battle is done, could problem solve, as she says. It endears us to her because this is very optimistic and oddly hopeful, which is something that we haven't necessarily heard from any of the gods yet. The best musical theater songs are extremely specific, but have a human element that we all relate to. And I feel like we all relate to this in some way. I think all of us want to make an impact somehow. And maybe it's not like a change the world level, but I know whenever I listen to this song, I'm like, yeah, I need to get up. I need to get going. I need to work on a video and record because that's how I reach people. This is also my unhinged collapsing anecdote of the day, but in my head, I imagine animatics, right? And like, that's perfectly normal. A lot of people imagine the songs in their heads with their OCs or whatever, but like in high school, did anybody else make an alter ego version of themselves that was sort of like the cold, detached, intelligent archetype because you were the bubbly, clumsy, quirky archetype and you needed to imagine that character or that persona soothing you because you were autistic and fragile and a girl failure? Or was that just me? because I did and I even commissioned art of that character. So listening to songs like this, I would imagine that that character was playing the role of Athena and like singing to me as I did my homework, like as a soothing thing so I could just like stop being upset and get shit done. Like I would take on the mask of the character that I was imagining. So anyway, I don't know if any of you relate to that, but I say all that because there is an element of self and other self. Like we may see Athena as an extension of our own ambition and our own ability to motivate ourselves even like we all have that logical part of our brain that is like just you know turn it off 
get the shit done, right? Stop crying about it, just go do it. Maybe though, if you're lucky, you're already as strong and cool as Athena. And so your beef is that people don't recognize you for the greatness that you have. It's like, you know that you're the shit, but you have to get everybody else on board with your idea. And I think those are basically like the two points that will find the song relatable as. This song always motivates me, and I don't think it's just because the instrumental is hype. It's because there's an empowerment here in how Athena believes that they can make a change. Because there's something so human about wanting to leave your mark. And in theory, Athena should have unlimited time to do this. Like, she's a goddess, right? But she seems to think otherwise. And that's a lot how, like, our lives are short and limited. This is also a little bit random, but I remember reading this thing once and it basically had the concept that every god to ever exist has existed. But when humans forget about them, that's when they like die and disappear, right? And so maybe Athena doesn't need to worry about dying, right? But she can worry about Ares eclipsing her. And that's also a feeling that we will relate to because there's this sense of rivalry. Like, we don't know who. Like, it's Athena against the world, but you can also imagine Athena against Ares. Or maybe it's just about the world in general getting worse, and if she doesn't intervene now, like, it'll never be a good time. Like, there will never be a warrior of the mind unless we start now because the training that people get, like, it'll be too hard to make them learn another way of thinking. Either way, it's catchy. It's a nice transition from the factual information to the emotional crux of Athena. And this is ultimately the thing that makes us feel as the audience. I'm gonna be honest, moving into where Odysseus comes in, like, I have no idea what this is. Like, a bridge? I don't know. Like, is this kind of a mysterious third thing in my mind? And I like how the beats, it's not really like the ticking anymore. It's more of a heartbeat now. And so you have the sensation that you transferred to Odysseus's POV instead of being in Athena's POV. We also have the danger is nearby lit motif with the violins as Odysseus knows that someone is watching him, but not necessarily who. Now that Odysseus comes in, we also have his guitar, but it's mixed with those trickles of Athena, as I keep calling them. And it's nice because it progresses the theme. It's not just the same thing that we've already been hearing the entire time. It's similar, and it's similar to the piano chords that were in the verse as well, but it's influenced now by Odysseus, which is important in musical theater, to have characters reacting and that reaction being reflected in the music, and it also contributes to our surprising yet inevitable. Show yourself, I know you're watching me, show yourself, I can see you, how can you see through my spell, <laughs> I was lying, and you fell for my bluff, <laughs> well done, enlighten me, what's your name, you first, and maybe I'll do the same, nice try, for two can play this game. Nah, don't be modest, I know you're a goddess, so let's be honest, you are Athena. Athena. Badass in the arena. arena. Unmatched pretty and queen of the best strategies we've seen. If you're looking for a mentor, I'll make sure your time's well spent. Sounds like a plan, goddess and man, best as a friend. We'll see where it ends. Oh, okay. Otherwise, for this section, as you guys can see, I didn't mark out the meter or anything because it doesn't really matter. This doesn't show up again. And also, this is supposed to be more a natural conversation with a melodic vibe, not full on singing. And we do have spell and fell, which is nice, but I just love the acting choices here. I love how this shows Odysseus's youth and his mischievous side. And this was captured very well both times, but I feel like in the re-recording, even now, you get that I was lying and it sounds like his voice is almost gonna crack, but like, in a good way, so it re-emphasizes how young Odysseus was here. This was the first song I heard, and this dynamic was so endearing to me. It gives a balanced impression of Odysseus, too, in terms of our theory, because he takes pleasure in his little victory, but he's obviously still cautious. Again, he's not a coward, but he's not reckless and stupid. He has an appropriate amount of courage in the face of fear. The last slide introduces a very endearing dynamic, and then this continues it. In terms of the meter here, I love the consistency of the back and forth. It makes it feel like they're basically like swinging a tennis ball at each other, right? Like with equal force until Odysseus takes over and wins. We're very clean with our 999, and then we're also very clean with our 555777, etc. I also like how Athena has this line that interrupts and grows to eight before going back down to seven. 
the growth on if you're looking for a mentor, I'll make sure your time's well spent. It feels almost cheeky, right? Like how she sings looking, like has a nice little flick to it versus the finality of that offer. Clearly Odysseus is super enthusiastic here. So I just think it's hilarious to see her be like, well, if you're looking for someone, you know, this is what I bring to the table. Like knowing full well that this is the greatest good that Odysseus is ever going to get. He would never say no to this, but the way that Athena makes it sound is like he might say no. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, well, if you're looking for a mentor, like he'll be like, nah, I'm good, bestie. <laughs> like, of course he's looking for a mentor, right? And so it's cheeky. It's cute. It's endearing. I just love their dynamic dynamic here. Again, we have consistent syllables, which are the same or the same amount of force or energy. And then we have the increase or decrease with that energy. And that energy changes. We have the rising and falling as their lines change. Similar to this up here, Odysseus with the 444, these are lines that have very equal energy. But then Athena comes in with that five, like, we'll see how it ends. And again, that's another cheeky line. But it also subtly foreshadows the fact that Athena has the final say, right? And that foreshadows my goodbye. She doesn't perfectly match Odysseus's energy here. Why? Because she is still in charge and she's reminding him of that with the syllable growth. In terms of the alliteration, I like, well, what's, try, to, this, the. We also got Athena, arena, sea, strategies, seen. And strategies we've seen is especially nice because it's the same line. And then I also like spent being sort of, you know, close by. It's close by, right? So see, strategies, seen, spent. And then we also have will, wear. In terms of rhymes, name, same, game are all perfect rhymes. And we have this mixture of perfect and imperfect being used. And it's interesting that that happens with Odysseus. Modest, goddess, honest, don't rhyme perfectly. Whereas Athena and Arena apparently rhymes perfectly according to my rhyme dictionary. I didn't think that it was going to, but it does. But this gets interrupted with queen of and then scene. And it's interesting because I was wondering, like, why didn't they just do unmatched witty and queen of the best strategies we've seen? But I think it does add something because it makes it feel a little bit more genuine to me. Of course, it also goes with our theory about that balance, right? Like moral virtue balance. But the balance of imperfection and perfection throughout the show does make Odysseus feel more human. This isn't Odysseus showing off and being boastful. He's not falling into excess or deficiency morally. He's genuinely excited to meet Athena. Because think about it. He could have bragged about himself in that moment, right? Instead of being like, I know you're Athena, he could have said, let me introduce myself. I'm the shit, but he clearly respects Athena. And so that's why I love this mode, <laughs> right? Because he's just a little nerd who's meeting his idol. And again, the lyrical meaning is pretty obvious here, but I love the lines of I'll make sure your time's well spent because obviously this comes back in my goodbye in terms of Athena saying that it's a waste of her time, right? If Odysseus isn't even going to listen to her. And I've been thinking about this more, but it's not even just you're wasting my time if you're not listening to my advice. Like it is, but when you think about Athena and her pride and her vanity, in a sense, it would actually be embarrassing for her if Odysseus is associated with her. Think about things this way, right? Athletes get sponsored by brands, all right? You have Odysseus, Warrior of the Mind, brought to you by Athena. Now Odysseus goes through and does stupid shit everywhere, right? Like with the Cyclops and then with Poseidon and all these other things that Odysseus goes through and does. Like Athena can't put her name on that. She's gonna pull her brand sponsorship because he's doing problematic things. <laughs> she has to cut ties with him because she doesn't condone that. Like Odysseus is her advertisement, right? He's supposed to advertise how Athena Athena is amazing and he's doing a shit job. So there's the personal betrayal of you're not listening to me, so I'm leaving. But there's also, I literally cannot be seen with you in public because you are so mortifying, right? You are so embarrassing right now. And I like these lyrics a lot because that's Athena hindsight, I guess you could say. But with Odysseus, we see his youthfulness and his optimism and how he was before all the tragedy he experienced. And this brings us into the course. And the lyrics are mostly the same, so all the good points from before still apply. But where the lyrics do change, it's so satisfying because it reflects that Athena and Odysseus are singing together. But not only that, it actually sounds better now that they're singing together. Like the alliteration is stronger. We have we and warrior, and that inherently sounds nicer. It's like Athena's point was not complete, but now it's complete with Odysseus.
I love when a chorus comes back with slightly different lyrics. It's my favorite thing ever. But you may be wondering, why doesn't the instrumental change a little bit too? Why didn't they add Odysseus's guitar in here to represent him like they did before? But to me, this actually makes a lot of sense because if you think about it, Athena still needs to be in charge here. She's mentoring Odysseus, which means Odysseus needs to follow her and her musical lit motif and themes. Where Odysseus' influence does come in, though, is that Odysseus creates a harmony. At first, Athena sings her original melody, right? She sings it the way that she did before. But the second time, she sings the same part. She copies the rift that Odysseus is doing. most control, so Odysseus's instrument is not here. But to show that Odysseus is still impacting her, Odysseus changes her a little bit as well. And you can feel the warmth in her voice, the warmth that she presents to him as she mimics the riff that he does. Because again, at first they have harmony, right? She hears the riff, she's like, what the fuck are you doing? And then she actually joins him the second time. And this ending brings us back to present day. And it's a nice mix of the chorus and other things that we heard before, but it's still its own thing. If form follows function, this has a different function than everything else, so it has earned the right to change structurally. It's doing its own thing. It needs to conclude and wrap up the journey that we went on. And it does that by using a little bit of what's familiar, but also having a different structure. This is a great choice. And instrumentally, I like how the piano chords here, they feel a little brighter than when we heard them in the verse. Like in the verse, they were kind of ominous. We have the trumpets back in, but then when Athena says, don't disappoint me, that's where things get scary again, because like we have a bit of victory here, but then we have the thing that would undo the victory. And so we have a satisfying conclusion, but we also have a bit of a cliffhanger, a bit of a foreboding statement. I still intend to make sure you don't fall behind. Don't forget that you're a warrior of a very special kind. You are a warrior of the mind. Don't disappoint me. In terms of the structure and meter here, like I said, this isn't copying anything so it can do whatever it wants, but we have a mix of that warrior of the mind structure and then let me remind you, don't disappoint me. And that gives us a full circle moment. In terms of alliteration here, I like I, intend and then we have sort of a front thing like we have don't fall and then don't forget which obviously that starts with the same letter and then we have don't disappoint for also starting with the same letter but then we have a back end thing with don't forget and those are back to our crispy t's don't forget that and even don't disappoint, right? Also has a crispy T. So again, a nice mix of front alliteration and back alliteration. We have perfect rhymes with behind, kind, and mind, and then we end on this ominous non-rhyme of don't disappoint me, which I really, really like. But I think why this is so compelling is because it foreshadows the fact that Athena's temperament is completely dependent on Odysseus. If Odysseus is successful, Athena will show him off to everyone like a proud dance mom. But if he is not successful, that that is when her temperament will go out the window, and that's what's foreshadowed by the don't disappoint me line. Right now, we're in balance, but Odysseus will tip the scales. In terms of lyrical meaning here, this is the first time that Athena is really talking about Odysseus. Yet, it's still not listen to me if you want to get home to your wife and your kids, right? It's only about him being special in relation to her and her plan. She does not care about Odysseus's mission. She only cares about him facilitating her mission. And this is a nice segue into the one issue that I do have with this song and what I think prevents it from being perfect. And before I reveal it, I just want to thank my patrons on Patreon, as well as my YouTube membership members. Without them, I couldn't do anything, so thanks to them so much for supporting me. If you want to see my videos before anyone else, suggest what videos I will make next, and continue to facilitate me making them in the first place, you should totally check that out. I also have commissions open if you want to commission me to cover your favorite song or you need songwriting advice. And I have a songwriting consultation commission open as well. But without further ado, let's talk about the Achilles heel in Warrior of the Mind. 
I don't know if you guys can tell, but I'm starting to lose my voice. So let's talk about the big issue with this song before it happens. And if I was consulting, this is how I'd advise to fix it. This song has a fantastic personal narrative, and I'm a strong believer in every song needing to be a story in of itself. Like a song in a musical should not just be part of the greater show, but it should also have its own exposition, conflict, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. Other songs we've covered on the channel really struggle with this idea of the personal element of the personal narrative, but this song knocks it out of the park. The issue that I'm going to talk about actually comes from the other end of that same spectrum. This song lacks clarity in terms of being part of the greater theme. Usually a song entirely misses the forest for the trees, but this song has a great strong tree, it's just not planted in the epic forest with all the other trees. This song has a strong personal thesis. The personal thesis, or the point, is very sharp in the let me remind you. As in, Athena is reminding Odysseus what he told her he believed in, that he believed in their joint mission and their joint philosophy. So it's remember what we agreed to? Remember what we were fighting for? The deal that we made? By the end of the song, we have the crossroads laid out in that thesis. If you go down this path, you are betraying me. You are betraying our bond and everything we fought for. I can't work with you if you don't believe in what we set out to do anymore. You're smarter than these people. You're literally built different. Don't disappoint me. It's a warning. However, where I think the song does have an issue is not actually addressing the larger narrative thematic question. And because I have the benefit of listening to the other sagas, I know what they wanted to do, right? They wanted to start to set up the theme of this conflict of ideals. Like you have Polites' philosophy, then you have Athena's, then you have characters like Zeus and Poseidon and Odysseus struggling with what to align himself with. Odysseus is struggling with what he wants to be and what he wants to emulate. But despite listening to the epic literally every day, it never occurred to me that open arms and polities is what triggered Athena's anger here. I never wondered what made her mad because the gods can be enraged by a soft breeze, but it hit me that when I was writing this script, I literally didn't know. And that's very unusual for me as someone who basically has a degree in media literacy and then also made a career not off of just one, but two YouTube channels analyzing stories. I had to look it up when I was making this video and that's when I realized that Athena was mad about Odysseus repeating Polites' philosophy. And I think the main reason why this is unclear is because her conclusion here does not reflect this. The rest of the musical is about the fact that Odysseus cannot find the middle ground, right? Like, he follows Polites' advice with Circe, let's say, and it works. Other times he follows Polites' advice and it doesn't work. But instead of realizing that he needs to be more discerning when it comes to when to use certain advice and when to use other courses of action, instead of realizing that, he just throws the whole philosophy away, right? He decides if he can't do it Polites' way, he goes to the other end of the spectrum and becomes a monster. In the Thunder Saga, it is not ruthlessness as mercy. He is excessively cruel, and that cruelty also goes poorly for him. If this song is about Odysseus's purpose and how Odysseus is straying from that purpose because he is listening to polities, I still intend to make sure you don't fall behind does not serve that objective. It's a big fat nothing. It's a nothing line, right? Fall behind makes it sound like falling behind on your training, but like, this is a grown ass man. He is trained already, right? And I actually did take a little survey with people that had not listened to the epic before. I had them listen to Open Arms, and then I had them listen to this song, and they still still did not connect that these two things might be related. They thought that it meant falling behind compared to his competition, and they just imagined other competition for him, right? And so these lines are way too vague. They don't convey Athena's point correctly. Athena is not mad about Odysseus falling behind in some nebulous way. The culprit is right there. She is worried about polities dragging Odysseus down. She is mad Odysseus is listening to polities over her. That is the conflict, and that makes things more more intense on a personal level and establishes the narrative thematic question. Odysseus listening to Polites' philosophy about greeting the world with open arms is not falling behind. It is Odysseus being blind, which happens to rhyme with everything else. You guys see where I'm going with this, right? His love for his friend is making him see the world through these rose-colored glasses. 
Athena is already petty. She should be even more petty that Odysseus is listening to this mortal man over her and her wisdom. And it would hurt even more because Odysseus says in the flashback, we'll be bestest of friends, right? But then when you get to here, it seems like by the time we get to this song, Odysseus values Polites as a friend more than Athena. Yes, it's a mentorship breakup, but it's also a friendship breakup. And part of that is Athena does not want to acknowledge that she thought of Odysseus as a friend ever, right? Because it hurts too much to think that they were ever friends because he just tossed her aside for his other friends. So again, if I were consulting, the logical fix here is to get rid of this line. Get rid of this line too about Odysseus being special. We already know that. We don't need that either, right? And have instead Athena openly mock the idea of greeting the world with open arms and lighting up the world. It's a lack of clarity in this ending that prevents the song from being perfect or a masterpiece by my categorization. It would strengthen the entire theme of this musical and this song if Athena explicitly conveys to Odysseus that the problem here is that he is not thinking like a warrior of the mind. His issue is a lack of control between extremes and a desire to appeal to everyone so much that he's like, he's lost the plot, basically. Odysseus has lost the plot. And you see that throughout the musical, he mimics other people. He takes their motifs and their melodies to convince them to do things. He manipulates them and spits them back out, right? He chameleons into their ideals, which compromises what Athena taught him. So let's have Athena explicitly sing that if Odysseus lights up the world and does what Polites is suggesting, that flame will be a target, but it will also make Odysseus blind. So this is a placeholder lyric that I would send back to the person in question. Again, if this was a real consultation, like I said, I would send this back to them just so they understand the vibes, right? Light up the world and your own blaze will burn you blind. There is wisdom in distincting, being good from being kind. You are a warrior of the mind. Don't disappoint me. And this would be much stronger for the Cyclops saga when Polites ultimately dies because Odysseus does what? Blind the Cyclops, right? His main argument to Athena is because the Cyclops is blind, there's no reason to kill him. And something interesting that happens throughout this whole sequence is that Odysseus is saying to the Cyclops, I'm glad that we now see eye to eye. I'm glad that we have a mutual understanding. We are equals to each other in this moment. But then obviously the Cyclops is like, nah, fuck that, <laughs> right? And then Odysseus blinds the Cyclops, literally blinds him. But with that exchange, there's a crew twist of fate, there's an eye for an eye exchange because Odysseus's pursuit of the light or kindness and mercy makes him blind to the danger. The Cyclops is literally blind, right? But the Cyclops blinds Odysseus right back. It's just a metaphorical blindness since Odysseus refuses to see how leaving the Cyclops alive could be an action that has catastrophic consequences later. This is another general suggestion, but I think another issue may be that we don't hear about Athena in the show until now. Like Odysseus doesn't seem to make any past reference to her. Like, obviously we hear her lit motif sometimes, but I wonder, like, what did she think of what happened in Just a Man? Like, did she think anything? If Odysseus is a warrior of the mind, was there a smarter way to handle things or did she stay out of it because that was the wisest thing to do? Again, since Odysseus never made reference to her before now, it really reinforced to me that her beef could have been anything he did in between Horse and the Infant all the way to now. Obviously the Troy saga came first, and so I think as the sagas went on, the storytelling became more clear, but I think that we can just throw in a like Athena like before just a man or something and then have her not answer like it doesn't even need to necessarily be like part of the song like he doesn't need to sing about Athena it's just like as he's holding the baby or whatever before he picks up the baby even like just when the the song is starting and you have that intro where nobody's singing he could just be like Athena hello and like she doesn't do anything because she has faith that he'll make the right choice as I mentioned before, the problem with Odysseus as a fatal flaw is that he takes every piece of advice to the natural extreme instead of being a warrior of the mind, which again, if we're talking about Aristotle, should be operating in a balance. We need to be clear in this position now because by the time you get to the Thunder Saga, you may be like, well, Odysseus is following what Athena wanted and he still got screwed over. So wasn't she wrong? But no, Athena never says that there's no place for mercy. She just literally says that when Odysseus has a problem, he will have an answer and it's discerning what the answer is, like what the situation calls for properly. There's a place for mercy, but there's not a place for sentiment and that's Odysseus's issue. 
And I feel like something else that would be useful to foreshadow here somehow is that Odysseus goes to these extremes because he is guilty about the baby. Like he tries to do a mercy to the Cyclops because he feels guilty about killing the baby. So maybe it would be nice to work in somehow that like the guilt that Odysseus feels in his heart will not be alleviated. In the Thunder Saga, he chooses to become a monster because monsters don't feel guilty about what they do. Whenever he makes these poor decisions, he's not doing it to be good. He's doing it to get rid of his own guilt. So I feel like that in Athena land, right, in terms of what Athena thinks, I think that being good means making difficult decisions and feeling guilty about it, right? Not having false mercy to alleviate your guilt or extreme cruelty to numb the pain to your actions. So I think that's something that would have been nice to work into here a little bit is that being a warrior of the mind does mean living with the guilt that you have. You can only feel guilty if you have a conscience, if you have a scrap of moral virtue left, and I think that should have probably been in here somewhere. And Warrior of the Mind is still an excellent song, but this is a good lesson for how things become clear as you develop your concept. As much as you find the theme or have a theme that you want to explore in your work, sometimes the theme finds you. You can't write the beginning without knowing where you'll end up, and I'm not saying that Jorge didn't have a destination in mind, but he is deviating from the canonicity, like from the canon story of the Odyssey. Those changes, like the changes you make along your journey, sometimes deviate from the original ending you thought you were going to have. But even still, even though as the sagas go on, the theme becomes more clear and more precise in how each song contributes to answering those thematic questions presented by the narrative, the lack of clarity in this song is not like an irredeemable flaw. It's just natural. Like, it's natural for a concept to go through changes, and something like this could iron itself out when the story is done, like when the concept is done, and then we're going back to rework it for the stage. Like, the great thing about a concept, as opposed to a finished Disney movie, right, is that the lyrics can be changed and reevaluated to suit what audiences are understanding and not understanding. And the epic, when you think about it, is basically, like, the largest test audience that any artist has ever had when it comes to musical theater. At least it feels that way. Even with Broadway shows like Hades Town, they still make lyric changes. Like, the show should be set at this point, but they still make lyric changes on Broadway. They've revised whole sections, they've cut songs. So the reason why this is not irredeemable for me is because we see with each saga, Jorge continues to evolve as an artist and refine both his musical skill, but also his storytelling skill. And so if we're starting at such a strong place, like, if we're starting at a 90% basically, right? I truly believe, like, imagine what the epic is going to to be like when it gets to the stage, when it gets to Broadway. Like, it's going to be an absolute masterpiece if this is where we're starting, and that's why I feel so optimistic in this video, as opposed to, like, in my other videos where I'm just sad and disappointed at a lack of potential, because we still have so much potential here. But if you want to hear about another song that I think is a masterpiece when it comes to foreshadowing the theme and thematic question, you can watch my video about Free from Barbie Princess and the Popper. This has been Kalax and caring way too much. Oh my god, I've been recording for three and a half hours! Get me out of here! I love all you guys. I'm glad that all of you guys care too. But I'll see you next time. We gotta end this. I gotta go. <laughs>